जय हिंद नमस्ते वेलकम टू गलपतरू द ट्री ऑफ स्टोरीज व्हिच इज अ सेलिब्रेशन ऑफ इंडियन फोक टेल्स माय नेम इज अंबालिका एंड आई एम एन ऑथर एंड स्टोरी टेलर एंड गलपतरू इज माय स्पेशल स्टोरी टेलिंग इनिशिएटिव ऑन द ओकेजन ऑफ द 75th ईयर ऑफ इंडियन इंडिपेंडेंस If you are new to this channel, heartiest welcome. I'm so delighted to find you here and I invite you to check out all the stories that we have done in the series starting from 26 January this year. And if you're already a long-time viewer, thank you so much for your support. It's been absolutely fantastic having you encourage me. And it is because of your unwavering support that today we are having this 25th video. Yeah. Ideally I should be calling it 25th episode but in Galpataru our definition of an episode is slightly different the actual story is the episode because prior to that story there is a curtain raiser which has a lot of facts and historical background to the story and the region from which it comes from so together with the curtain raiser and the story is what makes one episode technically but video wise every story has two videos curtain raiser and episodes which means we have done 12 stories and 12 curtain raisers till now which means 24 videos and this is the 25th one and i am so delighted i'm seriously very excited to get this going If you want to be a part of this journey go ahead hit on that subscribe button and click on that bell notification so that whenever there is a new story coming out whether it's the actual story or the curtain raiser you don't miss it And what's even more exciting is that you do not have to get to know about these folk tales by reading you can just do it by viewing and every time you view like give a comment or share it helps me reach more people and that takes me one step closer to taking indian folk tales to every person on this planet adult or child wouldn't you like to be a part of this movement too i invite you to join me this week's folk tale is from orissa and just like in the previous cases we are going to look into the history of documentation that brought all these folk tales closer to us in modern times because you see we really do not know who started telling folk tales no matter which part of the world we live in since humanity existed folk tales have also existed but they were always verbally passed on from one generation to the next it is only when somebody took a conscious effort to write them down so that they stay recorded that we came to know about it in their original form and in the indian context this work was started during the british administration which is like from the time of the east india company so in the case of orissa also it's no different the britishers came to orissa in 1803 which means this was before india formally came under queen victoria Now before we go into the documentation bit of uh, the scheme of things we really need to know two things that run in the background one is a language conflict and second is the nature of administration the focus on education which really played an important role in folk tales getting documented but first a look at the language conflict You see the Oriental language originates from a common variety of the Indo-Aryan language family which is called the Magadhi Apabhramsh and from this came up a language called the Udra Bango Kamrupi and as the name suggests you can already guess that there are three languages involved over here and Kamrupi became the Assamese language Bango became the Bangla language and Udra became the Oriya language However, the Bengali language did try to dominate the other two and this conflict was quite a bit severe when looked at it from the Oriya people's point of view. This did pose a lot of problems, challenges to the administration. However, it was sorted out when Orissa was on the basis of linguistics separated from Bengal. But this did shape a kind of mindset amongst the administrators alongside of this was the educational reforms that came into existence in 1854 thanks to the policy suggested by sir charles woods to the then governor general of india lord 
Dalhousie. This new policy suggested that the British style of education be introduced to the Indian society and the purpose behind this was to create in the Indian amongst the Indian population a, an elite class of people who would be trained in the British way of doing things thinking and approaching matters and that would enable them to serve the East India Company in their administrative work. So what Sir Charles recommended was that along with vernacular languages, English should also be promoted. In fact, his exact recommendation was that primary schools should impart education in the vernacular languages. High school should adopt both English and vernacular medium, whereas college level education should happen only in English. And that is the reason why the universities of Calcutta, Madras, Bombay, Punjab and Allahabad came into being. It was not just education in general that they were focusing. They were very specific about vocational training and also encouraging women's education. But that was a time when people had bad feelings about sending their daughters to schools. And this is best described in the story Revati, written by the leading Oriya writer of those times, Fakir Mohan Senapati, who is also known as the Ved Vyas of Utkal. So now you see what kind of challenges awaited the new set of administrators who were going to come in post-1857. And so that finally explains why the new set of administrators that came in were not just able administrators but also had backgrounds in anthropology and linguistics. This really helped them to understand and appreciate the value system, the ways and mannerisms of the people of the region that they were going to serve in and as a result of that integrate well with the society. To understand how a background in linguistics or an interest in anthropology helped them become more able of an administrator, here's an example. There used to be a belief and a practice in this region that if a couple was trying to conceive but could not have children, if such a couple went and took a bath in the Marichi Kund, then they would be blessed with a child. And if a child was born after many stillbirths, then that child would be given a very dirty, nonsensical name so as to ward off any evil eyes on it. Now, this really didn't make any sense to the Britishers. And they were very curious to understand what could be the logic behind this. But either the people were unwilling to share it with them, or even if they did, these British officers were just not able to appreciate it. It just did not make any sense. In fact, they regarded it as nonsense. In this light, it makes sense to recollect what John Beams, the collector of Balasore, has said. It is as important to know about the nonsense of the people because it makes as much sense as the common sense. <laughs> Well, these were simple matters. They were more serious matters. For instance, among the Kond tribes, there was a practice called Meriya in which a girl child was sacrificed. Yes, human sacrifice was very much prevalent in those times. When the British officers deputed to this region came to know about the Meriya practice, it certainly freaked them out. And they were not able to make any sense out of it and of course they wanted to stop it but without hurting the sentiments of the people how could they do this because they would have had to suggest an alternative this was not possible without first understanding what their belief system was so getting to know about their beliefs getting to know what drives them what motivates them to act in a certain way certainly helped them become good administrators. John Beams during his time was actually fascinated by the superstitions, charms and witchcraft prevalent in the people of Orissa. He noticed that there were certain practices that they followed when they were going out of the house or when they were visiting someone or when they were doing certain things or not doing certain things. And if by mistake they ended up doing those things 
then to counter the negative effects of the particular witch, they would chant a mantra. All of this was not just new to John Beans, but he sort of found it a bit funny. And he went on to learn more about it. And as a result, he came up with this paper titled Folk Tales of Orissa, which was published in the Indian Antiquary in 1872. Another British civil servant who made a significant impact on the Oriya society was Thomas Edward Ravenshaw, who was the Divisional Commissioner of Katak. He was entrusted with the responsibilities of furthering primary, secondary, vocational and girl child's education in the region. For over 10 years, he served this region with utmost sincerity and dedication. And this was inspiring for a lot of leading Oriya writers of those times. Inspired by Ravenshaw's work, Pandit Kapileshwar Bhushan Nand Sharma compiled a lot of popular Oriya sayings and brought it out as a book in 1876. Our focus is on the tribal folk tales, and work on this was done by an Indian, Lakshmi Narayan Sahu, who was a member of the Bharat Sevak Samaj. He collected folk tales from across the Oriya tribes, compiled them, and brought out a book titled Gandharvika Satadals in 1937. Apart from this, he also brought out a non story elemental book titled The Tribes of Jaipur in 1942. Jaipur refers to the region where the tribes more commonly lived. Talking about the Uriya tribes, many of them have contributed immensely towards the Indian freedom struggle. The most notable is Lakshman Nayak who belonged to the Bhuya tribe. Amongst the others are Chakra Bishnoi and Rindomaji from the Kond tribe, Kond as in K-H-O-N-D. From the Gond tribes we already are familiar with Ramji Gond and Baburao Shade Make. Then there are the Santals, uh, there are five names from the Santal tribes, one is Tilka Maji and the other four are brothers, siblings, Siddho Kano Chand Bhairav. Then from the Urao tribe, we have Jatra Urao, the father of the Tana Bhagat movement and the Koya tribes who allowed themselves to be persuaded by the leadership skills and the revolutionary ideas of Aluri Sitaram Raju. Of the other tribes of the regions are the Sauras and the Gadavas who have been living since the time of Lord Rama. Two popular folk tales from the Oriya tribes are the seventh son which is believed to be of Munda origin and when humans had tales from the Saura tribes. If you google for them or look them up on YouTube, you're going to find many wonderful interpretations and presentations on that done by children and adults, Indians as well as non-Indians. In Galpataru, you will be listening to a lesser heard folk tale. It is titled The City Rogue, The Village Rogue and The King of Rogues. Well, as the title implies, this has to do something with thieves and thieving. <laughs> and why not? As mentioned in our opening episode, folk tales are the stories of common men and that includes thieves as well. Why? Even thieves have stories to tell about how they succeeded or failed as thieves. Why not listen to them and maybe learn a thing or two from them as well? Hmm, sounds like a plan, right? Great! So while I go and prepare for that story, why don't you go ahead and hit on that subscribe button and tick that bell notification so that when the story comes live, you don't miss it. It has been an absolute pleasure searching for these stories, preparing them and bringing them before you and I am so excited to keep doing this ever and forever. Thank you so much once again for all your support. Congratulations to you as well for staying together in this journey of Galpataru. I'll see you soon. Till then, Jai Hind, Vande Matram.